push through and punch through a vision with passion, a vision with passion. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Purpose by Design podcast. I'm Pamela Hinkle. Again, so glad to have you here. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for subscribing. And I love you all so much. And as you know, every week, I am just so happy to bring you our guest because we just keep getting these awesome people that have so much that they can share and teach us. So today on the Purpose by Design broadcast, we are blessed and fortunate to have Patrick Norris with us, who is part of or the creator of Red Ink Revival and will do so much better at explaining all the amazing things that he does uh, than I will. So Patrick, welcome to the broadcast and please take some time to tell our listeners about you, what you do, and all that Red Red Ink Revival is about. Oh, you bet. Well, Pamela, it is such an honor to be with you guys and I'm so blessed to share my heart and a little bit of my story and pray that it makes an impact and helps some people. Um, my backstory, uh, I went to Bible college and out of Bible college, I guess spoke for a year and then at age 21 and single, I received my first pastorate. So I pastored uh, for two years and then I began to guest speak again and that ministry grew significantly for 13 years. Uh, by that time, I'm married, have two kids, little ones, and uh, the Lord it just really honored me as we collaborated and he let me start a church in Kansas City called Life Point Church. And so we've been here for 20 years and uh, the total amount is around 35 plus years of, of leadership ministry. And so uh, when I have gone through my entire life from childhood up, I struggled with panic attacks and didn't realize that that's what it was. Uh, there were a couple of times as I got older that it was so intense that it, in the middle of the night, I wasn't sure if I would come back into my rational mind. I wasn't sure uh, if I would be able to think straight. And of course, when you wake up, your blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, the rational brain comes back online and then you're like, wow, that was crazy. Uh, but there was suffering involved in it suffering involved with social settings, even though anybody that knows me or knew me in those days would have been shocked to know that that was the internal world that I lived in. Mm -hmm. um, and in time, the Lord really began to open some unique opportunities for me to grow my understanding as to why we do what we do. And so I learned some things around neuroscience. I've learned some things around psychology. And of course, all of that builds on top of my theology. And as a result of that, I have a real passion to help uh, particularly pastors, but really all people uh, to know what's driving them. We say that driven leaders ought to know what they're driven by. Right. And so we created what's called redinkrevival.com. And it's a platform that takes neuroscience, psychology and theology and gives people a real template as to why their personality has become what it is, mm -hmm. why people want what they want, where do desires come from, and even unmanageable temptation, what's happening inside the brain and the body that is causing it to be unmanageable. And so we are offering a lot of help uh, to people in, in that regard. So yeah, that's just a, a little bit of an overview of who I am and kind of what makes my heart beat fast. Wow. Well, I didn't realize the seriousness of those panic attacks that you had, but it sounds like it was pretty intense. Yeah. And really you didn't was. know that's what it was. No, you know, I just assumed that everybody dealt with it. It was just a common, you know, thing. Um, I was in a pastor's leadership training module in Chicago with one of the you know, big name uh, church growth guys and his organization. And he had in the 90s had an emotional meltdown, a, a psychological meltdown and went to a psychologist and they were really pressing that every pastor should have somebody to help unpack the intensity of, and complexity of what it's like to be in ministry. 
and uh, and I'm like, eh, that's not really that's not really what I grew up around. You know, I my thought was that you just take the word raw organic and you pray and raw organic and you fix everything that way. And so I thought, I don't really trust therapists at this point in my life because the ones that I met didn't seem like they had the tools to be able to, to make a difference. Um, and so I called this guy's secretary, the, the leader, and I said, hey, who, who's his psychologist? I want to go see him. So I went and saw him, and that was the first of uh, beginning to understand uh, that what was going on in me was inordinate. It was something that could be changed and uh and actually doesn't uh become extra biblical it's actually what the bible teaches but helps us get to the very root of what those things are um and so in time i i became a professional around uh, addiction and human behavior and what we know about addiction as as uh, an example is addiction is never about the addiction there are always underlying factors that are driving it, and it has to do with grief and anxiety. So I was like shocked as I fell into this uh, program to become certified as a professional by the International Institute of Trauma and Addiction Professionals. I was, uh, I was considered a unique uh, attender and participant because uh, that most of them were psychologists, neuroscientists, therapists, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I was just like a kid in a candy store. The Bible was coming into new color commentary for me, but the beauty of it and the passions, because I did suffer and I hate hearing about other people suffering. And it doesn't take long to hear that somebody, I mean, I, in the last month, I've had a couple of very difficult uh, examples of one guy was a leader in the worship uh, movement years ago and pastored a large church and committed suicide. Nobody talks about the suicide. Uh, nobody talks about the depression. We know that today, 70% of senior pastors struggle with ongoing depression. Um, and where do they turn? Where do they go? Right. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the backstory of it. Wow, that's huge. And that you were willing to step out of your comfort zone because obviously you needed it. I mean, you were hurting oh. enough. You were curious enough about yes. what you had heard at this conference that you were at, like, and really wanting to make that change. Like, okay, I'm going to step out. I'm going to go here. It's not comfortable, but I kind of trust maybe this psychologist because of who he's been with. And you stepped out there and it opened a door yeah. to help you, but then to help you help others. Yes. Is such a big deal. Now, I personally, when I was able to attend a couple of the different online things that you've done, um, I know you do so much more than that, but in our society as it is right now, so much of it is, you know, screen time like this. I just really uh, saw people, uh, I'll use the word, I mean, you could use it in a Christian circle, but you could use it in any circle, getting free. Yeah. They were able to bear their hearts and not be embarrassed that, yeah. you know, I wear this hat, whether it is this pastoral pro professional hat, or mm -hmm. I grew up in the church, or, um, you know, I'm not even sure sure if I want to be doing this anymore, or I'm, you know, I'm 50, I should know everything. I'm 70, I should know everything. The people were just able to get real, have their, share their hearts, bear their hurts, and that you had direction that wasn't just, excuse me, but high pie in the sky. Like you just said, like, just um, take this scripture to the letter six yeah. times a day. And I'm, and, and I'm all for daily affirmations right. and confessions. Right. I mean, I believe that what we, what we pray about, what we say about, we bring about, right? Yeah, right. But if, if we stay, if we don't deal with the roots of why somebody's hurt, like you just said, addiction isn't so much about the addiction. You said it's about trauma and it's yeah. about anxiety, right? Yeah. I immediately thought of some people that I know and I went, yeah, wow. Because when you know somebody's backstory, you yeah. can see it. And sometimes people are just so ashamed. Oh, they're, yeah. they're so ashamed. They don't want to talk about it. They're embarrassed. They feel like failures. And what I'm hearing you say is that getting in that right environment, like the one that you've created, 
Yes. Is giving a place where you don't have to be ashamed mm. and you can get free. You can absolutely. You don't have to cope. You can be move beyond that. Is yeah. that what I'm hearing you say? Absolutely. And, and to define freedom for, for me is not that you don't have temptations or that you don't have exposure to certain emotional cycles, but when you do, you have the tools and the understanding to actually manage it, manage through it, and to stay in a place of peace and joy. Um, you know, something that comes to mind as I think about all this is the, the biography of King David. Uh, King David's a guy who is famously told to be a man after God's own heart. Right. And that wasn't just a one-off statement. That seems to be something that carried through his life. But if you really take an honest assessment of David's life, it is shocking and even uh, can create some tension between some of the choices he made and then how could he have a heart after God? A, God would actually applaud it. Well, today, neuroscientists who are uh, of a Christian background would look at King David. Many uh, psychologists would even say that he possibly was bipolar or had borderline personality disorder mm -hmm. because of the intensity of King David's swing in the Psalms, where, as an example, he would be highly intensified with his anger, his rage, his uh, erratic kind of thinking. And then he would swing by the end of the Psalm and it would be the exact opposite, which really characterizes what bipolar and borderline personality uh, features are. Well, you go back to King David's early life, and when he's a little boy, a teenager, he's out in the field. Samuel comes to his dad Jesse's house and surveys the brothers to see if they would be the one God chose to be king. Yeah. And none of them were, so Samuel says to Jesse, do you have any more boys? You got any more kids? And Jesse says, I've got one that's out in the field. And he uses the term in the King James language, the youngest. But it's actually a Hebrew term, katan, and it's a word in the Hebrew that means the worthless one. Ooh. David David had a father wound from early in his life. Wow. Wow. And what when we think of borderline personality or bipolar, those are actually at the deepest part considered attachment disorders. The, they, the person did not early on attach well to the primary caretakers that were raising them. And so King David has that whole experience. But throughout his life, even when he is being erratic and there's different intensities and craziness going on in his life, he's always quick to repent. And the beauty of King David is, is he doesn't have his life together in every area. I mean, when you think of that when he did the Bathsheba event, and then Uriah is killed in essence because David set him up to go into the front lines. Right. Nathan calls him out, calls King David out, exposes the story to the whole nation. Mm -hmm. And God says, he's still my man. I'm going to keep him there. Yes, his choices will have lasting consequences. It's not God who's like, I'm just going to punish him the rest of his life. It's that spiritual law had been engaged, consequences were now there. But what I wanna highlight is the King David, he had areas of his life he was trying to just manage through, but he retained a pure heart. He retained a heart after God. So what I'm trying to kinda of highlight here yeah. is that people can have a very pure heart, a good heart, a heart that's after God, but be struggling with things that they don't understand why they're doing what they're doing, why they want what they want. Why is it as intense as, as what it is? Where's that intensity coming from? And so from a biblical perspective, from a psychological and a neuroscience brain kind of way, we can actually understand these things so that they can be analyzed, they can be measured, they can be reproduced, they can be in the replication, they can now then be something that you uh, can know cause and effect of how I can actually live differently and have peace and joy. I could live in a grace that I maybe didn't know my whole life. Wow, it's like the toolbox right? Yes. The toolbox of knowing how to navigate through your life and, and not just, well, this is just it. I'm just this way, 
but to navigate through it with victory and as you said freedom and understand that god isn't looking for perfection because he's, no. he's perfect we're yeah. not <laughs> i love that pamela it's so true you know and he works with our inadequacies and i always say you know he um he accepts us the way we are the great news is he's not going to leave us the way we yeah. are right yes, yes, and yes. yet he's such a gentleman i believe god is a gentleman that he is not going to force us into something he's yeah. going to lead us into change and there's just not always been as available as i think it should be yeah. in christian communities and, and and i'll just say outside of that to hear these other op options that, that you're bringing forth and to me they were nothing short of like the aha moment the light going on and saying i want people to hear about this mm -hmm. because you don't have to just stay under a title you know that yeah. you've been given medically you don't have to hide it you don't have to be ashamed of it no it's part of it might be part of how you're wired but there are ways to go to like you said roots and to have a toolbox to navigate through life and 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 be back in the driver's seat of your life you know and yeah. not have to be scared or ashamed or anything like that and and i think about today what's happening in our world and you know we don't have to go into all of what's happening in our world we know what's happening in our world yeah. and in our nation yeah. as a whole and so i really wanted to just spend a few minutes with you and and say let's talk about that let's talk okay. about what's going on with trauma let's and with um well, wow, with anxiety, because who, I mean, it's at a high point right now, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, higher than I've ever seen. I mean, I'm sure it's been higher, but not in my lifetime. I don't think people at their heart of hearts, most people anyways, want to be angry. I don't think most right. people want to be divided, um, but they are, we are. And so f with all of your background that you have and things that you've shared, in your opinion, what are these eternal thing internal excuse me maybe eternal yeah. <laughs> internal things yeah. that our nation as a whole like mm. people that are listening could go yeah that's what i'm struggling with what are some things that are kind of sabotaging us uniting because of all this is going on because at some point patrick we got to rise above all of this yeah. so yeah. that we can unify above all the noise so that was one of the questions i wanted to present to you what's your take on it well it's a great question and in today's uh, culture we notice that people struggle with holding on to themselves when another person disagrees with them yeah in other words what we have are identity issues what we have are what uh, more commonly would be described as a boundary issue. Mm. What boundaries are is the ability to separate myself from someone else to know who I am, what I want, and, uh, and know that what I want and what you want, what I believe and what you believe are separate. A big word that we use for that is called differentiation. Okay. If we do well at differentiating who I am from who you are, then I'm able to hold on to myself. I'm able to hold on to my convictions without feeling like I in some way am threatened because you don't agree with it, because you don't like it, right? So we have a whole culture of codependent relationships. Yeah. Codependency is, is that if you're not okay, I've got to do everything I can to get around you to make you okay. And so now I compromise self, I compromise what I want, who I am. I do everything in my power to somehow help you level out. Well, when you come back to who I am, what I want, what I don't want, what I believe, what, and I know what I don't believe. And then if I have a conversation with somebody and they disagree with me, I don't have to attack them. Because a lot of our attacks in these conversations are around the fear that somehow uh, I, I don't know who I am, I don't know what I want, and I will be hurt, I'll be rejected, etc. 
But if we're able to hold on to ourselves and be clear that, listen, this is how I experience whatever the hot topic is in the political spectrum, whatever these items are that are causing such disintegration, what I can do is say, listen, as I've listened, you know, researched or as I've listened to different pundits, of, as I've listened to folks, this is how I understand it. This is how I experience it. That is completely different than, well, you, you, if you start any conversation off with pointing the finger, you need to quit watching your TV station. You need to quit watching your news. You need to stop and read something and get educated. Well, wait, 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 wait. All I'm doing now is I'm communicating that I'm not at peace with who I am and I can't be okay unless I can convince you. So if you're not going to come my direction, I'm going to pummel you. Mm. Well, again, that is so uh, pervasive in our our culture today that if somebody disagrees with me, I have to say that they are using hate speech. Mm. Well, no, that's not true either. Just because you call it hate speech doesn't mean it's hate speech. Come on. So we don't have good conversation and all of us lose when we don't have good conversation. Disagreement is good. There's over 2000 denominations within the United States of America, within Christianity. In other words, there's 2000 people or 2000 denominations that in essence have nuanced ways of interpreting the text. Sure. It's not wrong to disagree. It's wrong when we begin to hold off from conversations because we're afraid that now then we can't be accepted. So again, it all is rooted internally in how you see yourself and your identity and how you see yourself. These boundaries were developed from your childhood on up. And many of the, these items have to be reprocessed. I, I just think of Hebrews chapter 12 and 15, where he says that a root of bitterness will spring up spring up and trouble the excite agitate and then he says and even defile the word defile is the greek word that really has to do with inking i-n-k inking and it has to do with an identity an emotional sense of who you are and what happens is is when you have encountered griefs and losses of your past your brain begins to file those in two areas the hippocampus and the amygdala and the episode of what happened to you, your brain is now in a heightened threat for anything that even looks close to that kind of thing. And so your brain, when you least expect it, is firing up these cortisol releases of fight, flight, freeze that are troubling you. And some of them aren't even credible threats, but your brain doesn't care. It feels like I will never allow you to not to go through what you've gone through in the past without warning you. Wow. So my takeaway from what you just said, if I'm in a discussion with somebody that is reacting like that, they're, yes. they're, they're being very reactive, not being, they're not responding. I say they're reacting, right? Yes. Yes. They're in a, they're in a moment, they're in a state and no matter how I would try to navigate through that, they're in a place because of what's happening scientifically on the inside of them and Absolutely. arguing about it is not going to change it it's going to increase it yes. it's going to make it spiral up where we need to maybe instead have some kind of understanding of that and respect the the, the boundary that that person is Huge. trying to put up and is confused and that, that, you know, and a lot of times, guys, I mean, let's just be honest about this, Patrick, listeners, that can be us. We yeah. Can oh, be yeah. Us. Oh, gosh. Not yeah. always somebody else, right? No. That, it, that it is so often, it is, it is us confused about our identity. And so whether you are the one pointing the finger, I liked when you say that, say, this is what I have learned. This is yes. not what I have understand. Now you're diffusing the situation and not saying you, because the minute you point you at somebody, like you just said, everything blows I, up. Yep. But if somebody is uh, having some of that stuff, identity issues coming up, you're really telling them your identity is wrong. Right. Your identity is wrong. You don't know who you are. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. man, that's going to cause all the more hurt. Oh my gosh. In a person. So so true. You know, if people could just learn this phrase, um, I'm experiencing right now 
is that what you want me to experience? I'm experiencing right now, fill in the blank, is that what you'd like me to experience? That's so um, I was I was uh, at a stoplight, funny story. I was at a stoplight and I was trying to, to find uh, the phone number on my phone of the guy I was supposed to meet running a little late. And I look up and all the cars in front of me were gone um, by long shot. And so I'm like, oh snap, nobody honked behind me and I take off. Well, I'm talking within 30 seconds, I've got a police officer behind me. And he pulls me over into a neighborhood and uh, he comes up and he's, uh, he's got some amperage already being released. He's got a lot of intensity. Oh, and I, uh, I'm interacting with him. And when I deal with police, uh, I believe in Romans 13, I believe in honor, I believe in giving uh, submission, which is an attitude. And so you know, I'm referring to him as sir. And he's just, I mean, he's drilling down. He, says, uh, I was in the parking lot watching you. He said, were you texting? And I said, no, sir, I was trying to find a phone number. Can I see your phone? And I said, I, I didn't laugh. I just said, yes, sir, here. And so I showed it to him and he it just continued. And it was just bam, 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 intensity. And so finally I just said to him, I said, officer, I said, uh, I'm experiencing that you're really angry at me. Is that what you're wanting me to experience right now? Mm. And immediately, because most people are not tuned into their emotional states. I don't care who they are. Most people have no idea the roller coaster that they are on in that moment. Yeah. They don't know why they're intense. And as soon as I called that out, and I did it with such a, you know, I'm not telling you you're, you're angry. I'm asking you because that's how I'm experiencing you. And as soon as I did, it diffused the entire intensity he backed up emotionally. He began to be gracious with me. And then ultimately he didn't give me a ticket or anything. And I, you know, I, I, I didn't do it for that reason. Um, but that's emotional intelligence. And often what we do again is when somebody's intense around us, we try to meet where they're at with the equal amount of intensity that only will further escalate it. So to borrow, which you as a foster adoptive parent, you know child psychologist who will teach you that, you know, if you think of the brain in three levels, the brain stem is the survival brain or what we'll call for kids, the basement. And when kids are erratic and irrational and they're doing crazy things in that moment and, uh, you know, they're thrashing, they're verbalizing, they're crying, you're not going to teach them anything because there's no blood flow to the prefrontal cortex. But if you can, in that moment, answer the question, the brain stems only asking this, will I survive? That's the question that has to be answered first. Then the midbrain or the emotional brain needs to know, do I belong? Do I, can I be seen, felt, heard, known? And once that gets answered, then the blood flow will reach into the upper brain or the upstairs, which is where rational thought is. You're never gonna teach a kid in a moment of erratic, irrational behavior. You're never going to teach them anything until you first are able to let their lower basement brain know you're going to be okay and I love you. Come here. Let me feel what you feel. What are you experiencing? And often a kid will be experiencing things that aren't true, but you validate the emotion without uh, supporting what they believe is true. You validate it by saying, man, if I thought that was true like that too, when I thought things like that, that's what I felt. Man, I just, I'm so, so sorry that you're feeling that. What you're doing is you're ministering to the brain in a way where finally you can come in and you can begin to, when those chemicals have released out of the brain, you can begin to teach again. But most of us in our culture with all the intensity around politics, racism, uh, anything that has to do with the coronavirus, who mask up, who doesn't mask up, all of those things are we're not even aware that people are in a heightened level of stress. Cortisol is surging through their brains and they're in fight, flight, freeze. And we're not going to change it by checking them. See, that's it. And in fact, we're going to make it worse. Yes. If we are not, you know, taking a moment to acknowledge this. Like you said, identify. What I'm hearing you saying is identify with them in 
in that moment. There have been so many times, Patrick, where I have, you know, um, I'm in Minnesota and there was a time this summer when my city was on fire. Yeah. And there are a lot of people's stories that I don't know and I don't understand. And yet I understand that when, okay, there were people probably burning cities that were doing it for wrong reasons wrong reasons or wrong purposes. But a lot of this anger that people were experiencing has to be coming out of that basement part of the brain. Yeah, absolutely. What, you know, and so when we're talking with people, uh, if remembering that and having a moment to tell them you're, you identify that you're sorry, I'm not trying to upset you, you know, whatever. I have found that that just brings everything down. Oh my God. Calms yeah, everything absolutely. down. And I can begin to have, make progress. That's the word I wanted to use. Uh, you can't absolutely. make progress when everything is, ah, yeah. right? We can't right. Absolutely. progress right. then. So in order for us to get out of this place, as I had said um, prior, where we can be united right now, we are going to have to stop trying to one-up everybody. Yeah. We're going to have to have a little grace, a little understanding, a little knowledge. Yeah. And I love how you explained that basement part of the brain, the mid part and the front part and how the blood literally needs to get there. Yeah. And it, somebody's going to have to take the high road. And Absolutely. Well, here's another part of it, Pamela, that's to me, it, this is just amazing. Uh, and it's, it's so true and you can, you can repeat it over and over and see the experience, both in you and the person you're talking to. The brain, when you're in a fight, flight, freeze mode, the amygdala, which is a part of the limbic system of the brain, is releasing cortisol. It's called the stress hormone. And the emotions that a person is feeling whenever they're in fight, flight, freeze is happening out of the amygdala. Well, God created us. This is so cool. He created us so that another part of the brain in the limbic system called the anterior cingulate gyrus, that when you and I activate empathy, compassion, or gratitude, empathy, compassion, or gratitude, okay. when we see somebody and we release that, what happens is that part of the brain releases oxytocin, which is called the love hormone. It's what a baby and a mama bond around. Yeah. And that oxytocin has the unique capacity to calm the cortisol releases in the amygdala, and then ultimately goes into the nucleus accumbens, which is where we feel dopamine, we feel alive, we feel like we're safe, we feel like we're happy again. We're back into a fulfilled state. Well, when you read in, in 1 John, the scripture says that perfect love cast out fear. Yeah. Well, this is the neuroscience behind the biblical theology. The okay. if when we hear, as an example, if you're talking with somebody who is in a, uh, a racism threat, they're talking about racial experiences of humiliation. Well, right now in our culture, you've got two people or two sides that are quite co contrasted. You've got one side that it's all about the experience of what has happened and is happening. And then you have the other that is very data driven, very data. Uh, you know, there's one side that says because of my experience that there's systematic racism. On the other side, you have those who have, you know, I'm thinking of people like Larry Elder or Thomas Sowell, Dr. Carol Swain, all black African-American uh, educators. They would say that statistics don't bear that out. Well, here's the, the problem with, with all of this. The problem is, is that the person who's experienced humiliation in racism, what they need is for somebody to see them, feel them, hear them, search them. And yet at the other side of that, if there are data, if there are truths, we can't let go of that either. But what often happens in the marketplace or in the public arena is that the data people are throwing data at the hurting people and the hurting people are saying, you don't get me and my truth is greater than your truth. And it's like, oh, 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 how about let's just let's just slow down a little bit. 
And let's just recognize that even Jesus is touched with the feeling of my infirmities. And if I want to be happy, I better give you some empathy. If I want to be happy, I better give you some compassion. If I want to be happy, I've got to have some gratitude. And then by doing it, what's crazy is, is I'm ministering to the other person's brain and I'm able to restore them to a place of contentment and happiness as well. And then we can have dialogue. But if I'm not speaking to the survival or the belonging first, I will never get to whatever the content is. So we need to be empathetic as a people. Yes. We have to be driven by that. So that means we got to put down, I mean, my, I want to be right. Yeah. We want to see what we all want to see happen. We have to learn how to be compassionate and empathetic. And, and sometimes we Absolutely. need somebody to remind us of that ourselves. When you said that, just to back up what you were saying, I remembered a situation we talked about my father before we started to record today. And my father ended up having to have a couple of different heart surgeries. I remember the first surgery and he wasn't even sure if he was going to have it. He was there talking to the surgeon on my request because uh, not having it was a good chance he wasn't going to live much longer. And the surgeon, who was supposed to be the third in the world or something like that, we were at the Mayo Clinic, uh, made, a, made a statement to my father, who was kind of a kind of cranky guy at that point in his life, um, you know, uh, said his name, said, Theodore, you know, yes, I'll do this on you. Do I think it's going to extend your life? Yes. But I guess I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if, you, were, if you were dead. He actually just said dead you know, within the next five years. Well, wow. knowing my father, <laughs> that was not going to encourage him to go through all of this to be gone in five years. So uh, being the way I'm wired, Patrick, I stood up and I said, Dr. So-and-so, could I please speak to you for a moment outside the room? And we stepped outside the room and he kind of had his little, you know, how doctors sure, can kind of sure. have that, I'm all that uh, complex. And um, I said to him, I said, how many how many open heart surgeries have you done? And, and he named it, you know, some big amount. And he had to have done that many because he was one of the best, you know. And I said, so my father would be what patient to you? And he said, I don't know, 2015 or something, you know, it was a big number and uh, could have even been more than that. That was a long time ago. And I said, this is my father's first surgery, sir. Not his 2015th surgery, sir. I need you to speak to him in that way wow. or he will not have it done. And I could see it was like the deer in the headlights, but the bl he started blinking. It was like it, it came through to him that I'm treating this man like a number, like my, my 2015 or whatever it was. And I have all of my data and experience, yeah. but for my dad, with all that he was hearing coming at him and where he was in his headspace at that time, he was on the verge of saying what you're saying, no, I'm not going to do it and be defiant about it and end up hurting himself and all the, all of us that love him all the more. That doctor went in and stopped, stopped treating my father like number 2000 and something or whatever it was um, yeah. and started treating him like number one. And identifying with him and being empathetic. Not only did my father have that done, my father followed with, in, with that doctor, connected with him for the next uh, 15, wow. almost 16 years of his wow. life. So wow. what you're saying, I just felt like that was kind of a bring it home. It's like, so good. In our own real lives, you know, what yeah. we can do when we will come understand these things you're teaching and it's how this can so affect good our world what this could do in our nation right now and this this i'm sorry to interrupt you no uh, please interrupt me <laughs> no 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 I, I just had i wanted to add this because of what we said earlier that when we don't show empathy the reason we don't is the resistance is around we don't know how to be uh whole as an identity who i am what i want we feel like that if I'm empathetic to you who disagree with me, and again, you can be talking about an issue of politics, you know, uh, something around critical theory, something that has to do with LGBTQ, 
Yeah. You can feel like that if I have empathy, then I'm now compromising me. And it's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. You need to have empathy, see people where they are, and without the need to control it. Did you know that the word envy in James, when he talks about when, whenever you have strife and envy, you've got every evil work, the devil runs rampant, there's confusion. It's interesting because the word envy gives us this idea of trying to own or coveting somebody else's choices that now we're not just wanting your stuff. I don't want just your stuff. Mm -hmm. I want your choices. Wow. And anytime you do that, you enter into, for your own life, every evil work. The devil gets a stronghold. And then for other people, you begin to break the relationships. So it's much healthier to lean in with care, see people for who they are, love them, ask great questions, and hold on to yourself. Recognize who you are. And even though you ask great questions and you're able to feel what somebody else feels, doesn't mean that you've compromised the convictions of your own heart. It just means that, and you can feel it. I mean, I, I know what it's like to begin to feel anxious because you're like, oh my gosh, what if they misunderstand my empathy? Well, wait, wait. That's not my role to understand or not understand, to make them understand or not understand. My role is to be present, to care for them, to love them. And then when I have the opportunity in that empathetic, compassionate heart set, I can speak the truth in love. But I do it not pointing a finger. I do it by saying, this is how I understand truth. Yeah. This is how I metabolize these ideas. What do you think about the ideas that I metabolize? Well, I can't stand it. I don't like it, which normally, if you're empathetic, you've already calmed them down. They're not going to fight you anyway. They'll just tell uh, with honesty and sincerity of heart what they perceive. But it allows for good conversation that otherwise could never happen. That is so good. That is so good. Um, I would like to add, I have one more question for you today. Um, in a recent Facebook Live of mine, I talked about voting for yourself. And I don't mean literally going to the ballot and putting your name in, but I, it was titled Vote You. Yeah. And how it is so important for us to get our focus off the wrong things, yeah. to get our focus on the right things, and that if we're going to make a difference in the way things are in general, we're going to have to start right here. Yeah. With ourselves. I'm pointing at myself right now. We have to start with ourselves and then look to our most intimate, closest relationships, our family, our children, whatever, and then begin to branch out from there. Yeah. Um, in your opinion, Patrick, how does a person begin to vote you, to vote for themselves in uh, this time? Again, I think it's learning to be clear as to who you are and who you're not, what you want, what you don't want. And as a Christian, much of that's already been decided for us. We just have to search out the Bible to find out what it is about us and what we believe. We have to actually adopt what God thinks. You know, for a lot of folks, they feel like that it's just an empty canvas and they can believe whatever they want. Well, you can until you commit your life to Christ and then you've committed to his lordship and the way he thinks. Now, I get it. There's a bunch of people who will disagree with your interpretation of a text and we have margin for that. What we don't have margin for is coming up with completely extra biblical ideas and acting like that that's okay as a Christian. So to vote you would begin with who are you? What do you want? And defining that through the light of scripture. Um, and then when you stand in your identity, stand in your sense of, of wholeness, your, yourself, uh, then you vote that. That's what you vote in light of, of what God says. That is so good. And with all that you do and all that you've shared today, there's going to be people that are going to be saying, I don't even know how to, how to begin to vote for me. I don't know what my identity is. You know, I went through this. I went through that. I don't know where to start, Patrick. Where could they start and how could they reach out to you for more information? Yeah, any, uh, anything that somebody would like to reach out with, just go to redinkrevival.com. And then we have an email address that is redinkrevival at gmail.com. They can reach us there. 
But I also would encourage everybody to, specifically on political ideas, uh, to get a, a book that is, uh, yeah, a great book is a, a book by Wayne Grudem around politics. Uh, it's Politics According to the Bible. And you may not agree with everything he says, though I find that I agree with a lot that he says, but at least it's a starting place for every, just about any possible political idea that is out there. Now, my question would be, if you disagree, what is your biblical foundation and interpretation? And if you have one, I applaud it. I, I, I think that's awesome. But if you don't have a biblical foundation, it's just that you have an, a, an emotional resistance, then I would ask you to, to pray that out until you can submit to what you believe is the Bible. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And you said the name of it again was? Politics According to the Bible by Wayne Grudem. It's a thick book, but awesome. Well, and we'll have all that information is in the description as well as how to reach out to Patrick. And I think you've given our listeners a lot to think about. I mean, about being more empathetic, understanding some of that scientific stuff about how the brain works is so important because if we're going to be whole, and I mean with a W, W-H-O-L-E, yeah. we have to understand that we are a multifaceted being. You're not, it's not, it's, we're not just, uh, just put here. I mean, it's amazing how we have been created and, and made and taking time to understand, as you said, why do I do what I do? How am I wired the way? Why do I think this way? And, and giving patience and grace for yourself to learn that, but then for others. On my staff uh, at a church and through the extended um, outreaches and ministries that we do, I get to know all of them in that way from taking different inventories and yeah. learning how they are so that I know what to somewhat expect kind of, but also understanding how people react. That's why this person, it might come across more aggressive and this one might be a little bit uh, more avoiding of, of confrontation and, and understanding how people network and work together so that we can function as an entity within a ministry or a business and not always be attacking each other. There's so much that we can learn about each other. And you have really brought a lot of stuff to light uh, today, Patrick. Before we close, is there anything that you feel like, oh, I really wanted to talk about that, but I didn't, we didn't get there. Is there anything else you would like to share? I think the only thing is that if people want to go on a continued journey with us, uh, Reading Revival, if you go to YouTube or wherever you get podcasts, I interview neuroscientists, psychologists, therapists, pastors around the things we've talked about today, and we do deeper dives into it. Uh, and so I would just encourage people to come be a part, sign up for the e-newsletter we have at readingrevival.com. Every month I write an article that uh, I believe can uh, cause you to pause and go, huh, and that's yeah. what we want. We want some huhs. So that's, right. uh, that's really all. And it's been such a privilege to be with you, Pamela. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your, your family here. Oh, thank you for being here. And I just want to give a backup plug. Those YouTubes are awesome. And as well as the newsletter, you guys, you'll get a ton of information out of it. So it is a great place to start to plug in. Thank you so much for sharing with us today, Patrick. And thank you listeners for being here. Um, I know that it's been a blessing to you. Please follow up with uh, Patrick at Red Ink Revival. And remember in everything you do, do it by being the salt and the light everywhere. Thanks for tuning in. We love you. Talk to you soon.